Welcome to World Med School. My name is Neil Schluger. I'm professor of medicine, epidemiology, and environmental health sciences at Columbia University in New York City. Today's lecture will cover the principles of therapy of the treatment of tuberculosis. The modern era of tuberculosis treatment began in 1948 with the publication of the streptomycin trial for the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis. This is a landmark in the history of medicine. It's the first randomized control trial ever to be done in clinical medicine. And in this experiment, conducted by the British Medical Research Council, 100 subjects were randomly assigned to treatment either with streptomycin or with bed rest, which was the standard treatment at the time. In this experiment, the 50 men who received streptomycin all quickly developed negative sputum cultures on this treatment. That's shown on this graph. For each patient, there's a bar. At the left side of the bar, the X marks the first day after the beginning of treatment that the patient's sputum cultures became negative. However, the right-hand X on the bar the X at the right-hand side of the bar marks the first day that the patients relapsed with positive sputum cultures and all of those sputum cultures were now resistant to streptomycin. From this trial, really, we derived most of the important principles of therapy of tuberculosis, and those are shown on the following slide. The first principle, of course, is that chemotherapy is the only effective treatment for tuberculosis. The second, single drug therapy for active disease is associated with a very high relapse rate and invariably with the development of isolates of TB that are resistant to that single drug. Therefore, patients with active tuberculosis disease should receive at least three drugs and in most cases four drugs as initial therapy to prevent the emergence of drug resistance. One should never add a single drug to a regimen that seems to be failing. And finally, a more modern principle is that compliance with therapy should be considered to be the responsibility of the treating physician and clinic as well as the responsibility of the patient. These are the drugs that we use to treat tuberculosis today, and I've separated them, separated them on this slide into first-line and second-line drugs. The first-line drugs include those that have the most activity against mycobacterium tuberculosis that form the core of our treatment of most patients uh, and that are highly effective. The second-line drugs, in general, are reserved for patients with drug-resistant tuberculosis or patients who cannot tolerate, because of side effects, the first-line drugs. In general, the second-line drugs have less activity in killing mycobacterium tuberculosis, and they're often associated with even more side effects. Current standard therapy for tuberculosis disease really, in most places around the world, is shown on this slide. Therapy for drug-susceptible TB consists of an induction phase that's two months long and that contains four drugs, isoniazid, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol, followed by a continuation phase of four months duration with isoniazid and rifampin for a total of six months of treatment. This regimen has several advantages. In patients with drug-susceptible tuberculosis, it's essentially 100% effective. That is to say, nearly all patients with drug-susceptible tuberculosis who are placed on this regimen can be cured and will be cured. Their sputum cultures will revert to negative, and they'll have a good clinical response. Overall, the relapse rate, if patients complete this regimen and take all their doses, is low, 3 to 4 to 5 percent. The regimen is inexpensive and affordable in most of the world, and therefore it's essentially universally available. In the final four months, in the continuation phase of this regimen, intermittent dosing three times a week, or even perhaps twice a week, is possible. Um, so intermittent therapy uh, is a possibility in the continuation phase of treatment with this regimen. On the other hand, the regimen does have several disadvantages. It's still six months long, which is a long duration for many patients. And in some subgroups, patients with very extensive burden of tuberculosis 
who are slow to respond during the induction phase, the relapse rate may be considerably higher in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 percent if treatment is stopped after six months. Side effects are common with the regimen. Uh, this regimen does include medicines that can have significant drug-drug interactions with some of the medicines we use to treat HIV infection. And by definition, this regimen is not useful against multidrug resistant strains of tuberculosis. Multidrug resistant TB is by definition resistant to isoniazid it and rifampin. But to reiterate, this six month regimen really should be the standard of care uh, for patients with drug susceptible TB all over the world. The International Union Against TB and Lung Disease and the World Health Organization have recommended a variety of regimens for the treatment of drug susceptible TB. And they're shown here, although clearly now we favor the six month regimen. An alternate regimen of eight months duration had been recommended previously. This regimen consists of a, an identical induction phase, usually four drugs for two months, followed by six months of either a Fambutol and Isoniazid or a Thiacetazone and Isoniazid. However, it's been shown recently that this eight, eight month regimen, although it's longer, uh, is less effective than the six month regimen. That's because the substitution of a Thambutol for Rifampin in the continu continuation phase makes the regimen less effective. In this trial by Amina Jindani and colleagues pub published in The Lancet in 2002, you can see that the six-month regimen shown in the right-hand column is associated with an unfavorable outcome only 5% of the time, as we would mentioned previously. The eight-month regimens, because they have a less effective continuation phase of ethambutol and isoniazid instead of rifampin, have unfavorable outcomes 10 to 14 percent of the time. So this eight-month regimen is clearly inferior. The six-month regimen should be preferred as initial therapy all over the world uh, and certainly for all patients with drug-susceptible TB. There are some clinical features, though, of patients even with drug-susceptible TB that could suggest a poor outcome with a six-month regimen. Patients with these features should be considered for prolonging treatment with isoniazid and rifampin in the continuation phase for two or three additional months. This study from Deborah Benader and the Tuberculosis Trial Consortium published also in The Lancet in 2002, lists some of those features. If patients have sputum cultures which remain positive after the induction phase is over, at the end of two months, that is, um, they have a higher rate of an unfavorable outcome. Similarly, patients who have extensive bilateral cavitary disease on chest radiograph have a higher chance of a poor outcome than patients with less advanced disease on chest radiographs. Also, although I'm not showing this data, patients who have lost very substantial amounts of weight prior to the beginning of therapy seem to have a higher risk of a poor outcome. No one of these features is predictive in and of itself of a poor outcome and no one of these features in and of itself is an indication to prolong therapy for more than six months. But when several of these features are present, physicians should carefully evaluate the patient and consider, in fact, whether or not prolonging therapy makes sense. What about just relying on sputum smear as a guide to therapy? Sputum smear microscopy should, of course, always be performed at the beginning of therapy, and really, in most cases, should be performed at the end of the intensive phase as well. A positive smear in and of itself does not predict with great accuracy a poor outcome, but a positive smear at the end of two months should trigger a careful clinical assessment of the patient and additional sputum monitoring to make an assessment of response to therapy and a possible need for prolonging treatment. The treatment of tuberculosis in patients with HIV infection is beyond the scope of this lecture and in fact is the subject of a separate lecture, but I would like to mention a few important points. 
The first thing is that patients with HIV infection with tuberculosis should certainly receive treatment that is no shorter than patients who do not have HIV infection. Secondly, all patients with HIV infection and active tuberculosis should be started on antiretroviral therapy regardless of their CD4 cell count. In general, TB treatment should be started first and antiretroviral treatment should be started as soon as possible after TB treatment begins. Although the outcome of treatment, particularly of drug susceptible tuberculosis, can generally be expected to be good, there are several barriers to the completion of therapy for active drug susceptible TB, and those barriers are shown on this slide. Many patients will perceive a stigma of having tuberculosis and will feel uncomfortable or will be unwilling to come to the clinic or to take TB treatment because of this stigma. Many of the drugs that we use to treat TB have side effects. These side effects can be bothersome to patients and will interfere with treatment completion and adherence. In most countries, TB drugs are available at a low cost or even free, but for some patients, the cost of the drugs may be considerable and may be interfering with treatment completion. Treatment is long, at least six months. Many patients will find this difficult. Many patients with TB will have competing priorities in their life that will interfere with their abilities to take medicine, such as a need for housing, food, or employment. Patients may have a lack of education or understanding about the importance of taking their medicine, and some patients with tuberculosis will have ongoing substance abuse, either drug or alcohol abuse, or mental illness that will make it difficult for them to adhere to therapy. For these reasons, programs of directly observed therapy have often been used to provide medicine to patients, and they are very effective in achieving high rates of treatment completion. Directly observed therapy programs can provide basic services or a more enhanced array of services, as is shown in this slide. The most basic service would be provision of medication alone. Additional services could include nursing for the provision of medicine, assessing side effects and patient education, the use of outreach workers to bring medications to patients who can't come to the clinic on a regular basis, and to track missing patients who have defaulted, the provision of incentives or enablers, such as funds for transportation to clinic, food, or bonuses for patients who have high rates of adherence, and finally, referral for social services, such as housing or substance abuse counseling. Programs that use the fullest array of these services in directly observed therapy achieve the highest rates of treatment completion, reaching or exceeding 90% treatment completion rates, which really should be the goal in every TB control program. Finally, of course, to put this in a larger context, um, directly observed therapy itself fits into an overall program of what's known as DOTS, directly observed therapy short course, which is much more than just simple administration of medicine. The DOTS strategy, as outlined by the World Health Organization, includes a government commitment to mobilizing sufficient resources for TB control, case detection through case finding with sputum smear microscopy in patients with symptoms, treatment with the standard short course chemotherapy regimens that we've been discussing in this lecture, securing a regular supply of essential anti-TB drugs, and finally establishing reliable monitoring, recording, and reporting system for program supervision and evaluation. The treatment of the individual patient really must fit into this overall context for the TB program to be successful. That concludes this lecture on the principles of therapy of tuberculosis. Thank you very much.